Good morning, good morning. Welcome, church family. As you all come in, file in, find a place to sit. There's lots up front. Welcome. If you're new this morning, welcome. I've seen some new faces this morning. Good to see you. Some faces we haven't seen in a while. And I'd like to welcome baby Charlie Fredrickson, who is here for his very first time. Where's little Charlie? I saw them come in. <gasps> there he is. Welcome, little man. Oh, love it. Well, a few announcements as we get started this morning. Uh, first announcement is the senior lunch this Thursday, the 26th at noon right here is the senior lunch. Tandy does a fantastic job bringing delicious food, good time of fellowship. So if you've been a regular attender of the senior lunch, or maybe you haven't, or you'd like to invite someone new, Either way, this Thursday, join us, and if you would, please sign up in the foyer uh, on the table. Just outside the door is a clipboard, and it's very helpful if we know who's coming so Tandy prepares enough food. So that's the senior lunch. Join us this week for that. Uh, also, the trunk or treat is vastly quickly approaching. Uh, the trunk or treat is going to be on Halloween, Tuesday, October 31st. Uh, we like to do this not only for all the kiddos within the church, but really as an outreach to our community. We try and do something each year. Uh, this is going to be our second annual trunk or treat. And as you see in the pictures there, that's what you do. You lift up the tailgate, you decorate the bed of your truck or the trunk of your car. Uh, that is a toilet you see there on the left full of candy. I was told that was a new, never been used for any other purpose toilet, and the kids got a big kick out of pulling candy out of a toilet. So uh, another one there you see decorated with Noah's Ark, but that's what the trunk or treat is. We're going to line the parking lot with as many vehicles as we can that can pop open their trunk and give candy to the kids. So there's two ways you can help with this. Number one, I would love to have a few more vehicles parked out there, decorated elaborately or not. Uh, but just a few people that can greet the kids, say hello to them, their families, just make it a, a, a loving opportunity for our community and to pass out candy. Second thing, way you can help is to bring candy. We ran out of candy last year. So if you don't mind, next time you're at the grocery store paying the absorbent amount of price it is to buy candy, grab a bag of candy, bring it to the church. That would be very helpful. There is a uh, little tote outside the door where you sign up for the senior lunch where you can also sign up if you'd like to do a trunk. And you will find that basket for candy donations. And we will be accepting those all the way through uh, the trunk retreat. So we can um, bless the children of our town with all this sugar. Feel free if you want to donate toothbrushes too. That might be an appropriate pairing. Uh, anyhow, so look forward to that on Halloween evening. There is no youth group that night. We've got several of youth that are going to be participating in this. So uh, come on out um, for that. Uh, another announcement is next Sunday. We are going to have one service next Sunday, and it will be the 1030 service. We're not going to ask all of you who normally come to this 1030 service to get up any earlier uh, to be here, but we um, have asked those who normally attend our 830 service to please enjoy a... Uh, quiet morning at home and come to church a little later at 1030. Right here in the building, we're going to have one service. The reason why we're doing that is because immediately following the service, we are going to have um, an open forum time where the elders are going to uh, bring to us kind of where we're at in the church building process. For those of you who are new or newer, we are currently building a new church. And if you drive out of town that direction toward the Little League field, you will see uh, under construction our new church facility. Um, we have thanked the Lord and thank all of you um, in this process. It's been going relatively smoothly. I'm looking at Chris. Okay, a nod. Yeah. Um, you folks have been so generous in giving of your time. A big thank you to all of you who show up during the week to work on the building. And a big thank you for those of you who have shown up these last few Saturdays to get that roof on. And I would say probably not quite three quarters of the way completed with the roof ish. We're getting there and we're hoping in the next few weeks to get the roof on. So if you have some time to give, uh, to get help get that roof on, you don't mind being up in, um, on the roof, uh, then please uh, see Sue Darrow, see Chris um, Waters. We've got many opportunity for that. And a huge thank you. And uh, we could not 
be where we're at now in this process without each of you. Another big thank you, if you look at the back of your bulletin, you're gonna see the financial giving toward our Building by Faith. We set a goal of $150,000 to raise by November. And that amount of money will allow us to close in the building, windows, doors, get it all closed into the weather. We have not only met that goal, but we have actually exceeded it. And even before our goal of November. So thank you. Thank you, church family, for your generosity in your time and your finances. So next Sunday after church, we want to have a chance for the elders to tell you what's next. There's different options and and ways we could go. We want your input, your feedback, and have any questions. And that's going to take place next Sunday after our one service that starts at 1030. We will serve some lunch. um, And then immediately after the service, we'll get going in here with that meeting. We'll have child care for all the kiddos if they don't want to sit in here in the chapel, and we'll try to keep it to about an hour. So please, um, member or not, if this is your church family and you want more information, please come next Sunday. A um, few logistical things I'll mention briefly. Number one, we are combining our two services, so we will be limited with chairs. We are going to ask that our jam kids, which is the first grade through fifth grade, When you get here next Sunday, head straight into the chapel, and we're just going to start jam. We'll have some extra activities, and we'll start that right from the beginning of service. Of course, our nursery toddler and the um, preschool class will still be upstairs from the beginning of service, but that will... Having the jam kids in there right away will free up some um, seats in here. And then finally, obviously, our parking lot is always an issue. Let's throw more people in there, and it's going to be an issue still. So if you have the ability to park at the school parking lot or at the park, the town park over here, and use their parking, that would be helpful to leave the parking lot here for our seniors or those who need to park uh, closer by. If you park at the school, we will have the church van shuttling people back and forth, so especially if it's raining, just hang out in your car until you see that big white van pull up, and we will uh, get you over here to the church, and then we'll get you back there after the meeting. Uh, So I think that's it. Last thing I'm going to say is Noah Miller... Happy birthday yesterday. Yesterday was Noah's birthday. And somebody, oh, that's right. Blake Guptill had a birthday yesterday too. Did you know you were birthday buddies? Yeah, excellent. Yeah, happy birthday. (laughs) Happy birthday, guys. Okay, and the last thing I'll say, because I'm up here and I'm seeing it's on the list, is we are preparing for our Christmas program. If your kiddos would like to be involved in our Christmas program, whether it be singing in the choir or... Uh, hee-hawing like a donkey, whatever. Um, We are going to have a um, informational meeting, audition, you could might say, find out what part you might be able to play in our Christmas program. For you kids, but if you have any adults that want to be a part of that, we welcome you as well. That is going to take place on Saturday, November 4th, 10 a.m., right here at the church. So if you have more questions about that, you can let me know. All right, let's go ahead and continue with our worship. You guys want to stand as we get started? God is greater, our God is stronger, 
God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome power, our God, our God. stop us and if our God is with us then what could stand against him if our God is for us then who could ever stop us and if our God is with us then what could stand against then what could stand
the mountains My God is mighty to save He is mighty to save Forever author of salvation He rose and conquered the grave Jesus conquered the grave Savior, He King of the mountains My God is mighty to save join me in praying. Lord, you are truly mighty to save. You are the God over all. Lord, open our eyes to see you more. Thank you, Jesus, that you died on the cross to save us from sins. Lord, help us strengthen us this morning to fix our eyes on you, Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before you, you went to the cross and endured the cross and scorned its shame and are seated at the right hand of the Father in victory, in rule and power and authority. You are worthy of all praise, Lord. Thank you for that victory and thank you for that salvation that you have purchased for us by your blood and this people here worshiping you together, a people purchased by your blood, Jesus. And yet it goes on to say that we have not yet resisted to the point of shedding our blood But thank you, Jesus, that you did resist sin and temptation to the point of shedding your blood on the cross. And strengthen us as we look at you, Jesus, and what you did for us and your grace to sinners. Strengthen us to throw off all the sin that clings so closely and entangles us and help us, strengthen us, Spirit, to run the race that's marked out for us with perseverance and joy our eyes fixed on you, Jesus. And Holy Spirit, just be doing your work here among us that you love to do of magnifying and drawing attention to and glorifying Jesus Christ. Jesus, be exalted and and honored among us and central among us. You are worthy of all praise and honor. And Lord, we wanna lift up our prayer families of the week. And in this service, it's Jeff and Kathy Carruthers. And we pray for them, Lord, for your strengthening, for your filling, your leading in their lives, in their marriage. Just be working in and through them as they work to bless others and take care of others. And we pray for for health for their bodies, that you would be blessing them in those ways. And, And Lord, we pray for all of those in the church who are struggling with health issues, with sickness, or maybe a long standing back pain or whatever the issues might be, depression. There's so many different things that we may be walking through right now. And I just ask for your help in each of those situations. You know every one of them intimately. No one of us knows all of the different situations, but you do, Lord. And we ask for your help and provision in each of those situations. Lord, we pray for Um, Aiden Gunderson, we thank you and praise you that you are working to heal his body and answer the prayers of your people and that he is doing well. We pray for full and complete restoration for him to his family. We pray for his, any, any issues around heart rate and low heart rate that you would be working there to heal and to bring him home and, um, We just thank you, Lord, and we trust that you are working there and give peace to his family. And Lord, we pray for Jim Johnson and his family, Lord, who has has passed away in this last week. We pray for for Kenny and for um, their family and just for peace, Lord, in these difficult, difficult times. Be near the family and comfort, be working in this situation. We thank you that you, there are evidences of your work in that situation, as difficult as it was. And Lord, um, 
we just trust all these things to you, all the things that are unmentioned but need prayer, Lord, just we offer them to you and lay them before you and be at work among us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Or you may be seated. I'd like to call the ushers forward for offering at this time. my privilege this morning to do baby dedications. And I'd like to call the Allen family and the Stenerson family up, uh, up on stage here as we uh, are going to dedicate um, their youngest 
youngest children. So they're bringing the whole family up, which is great. I, I mean, children are a blessing from the, the Lord. And uh, it's, it's such a joyful thing to dedicate them to him and his service. Just come on up here. We'll move this back. Um, I'm just going to set this down for a sec. All right. Um, so... I'll start here, and then we'll come across to you guys. But um, So this is Colin and Sharla Stenerson and their family. Um, it's been great getting to know you guys a little bit this year. And this is Ezra Colin Stenerson. And um, so I'm going to read a few questions for these guys to answer. But as I read these questions... You guys, too, it's opportunity just to be thinking about these things for your own families as well. And um, these are just good things for us as Christian parents to be thinking about as we raise our kids. Every time I go through this, I feel challenged and reminded and encouraged, like, okay, yeah, this is what we're doing, raising our kids. And for those of you who maybe don't have young kids at home anymore— This is also for you to be partaking with these families to help them in encouraging their kids in the way that they should go and supporting them as parents. It's no easy task to to raise our kids. It, It makes us feel limited and challenged, sometimes more than anything else that we do. And so they need strength and support from you guys as well in prayer. So we'll pray together and pray over the kids. You guys just join me in praying uh, as we pray for these little ones. And so, uh, Colin and Sharla, do you recognize that your children are a gift from God and give heartfelt thanks for his blessing? Do you acknowledge that parenthood is a magnificent responsibility and do you promise with God's help to protect and nurture your children physically, emotionally, intellectually, and spiritually? Will you, by the grace of God, bring up your children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, striving to live lives that are consistent with God's word as godly examples to your children? And Paul says, let marriage be held in honor among all. A healthy Christ-centered marriage is one of the greatest gifts that you guys can give your children. Do you commit to working for a Christ-centered marriage for your own joy and for the blessing of your children and for the glory of God? Will you rely on God for strength? Prayer, pray regularly for your children, dedicating them to the Lord in the hope that they will belong wholly to God and come to trust in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins and for the fulfillment of all of his promises to them, even salvation. Yes, okay. Well, with these commitments and with the whole church body praying with me, um, I wanna bless and pray for Ezra Colin Stenerson, he's just resting here, peaceful. Um, But Ezra, the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you, lift up his countenance to you and give you peace. Lord bless him. Uh, May he be grow to be a man of faith. And would you just gift him and bless him, strengthen his parents to raise him in the instruction of the Lord, and we thank you that, Holy Spirit, you are at work in these, these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. All right. So Mike and Alyssa, um, this is Emmy Lou Alyssa Allen. And so, hi, Emmy, Emmy Lou. Hi. <laughs> You're a little more awake. <laughs> um, being quiet over here. So I'm going to ask you guys the same questions and just bless Emmy Lou. And so um, if you agree with these, just say I do or yes. And and, uh, Do you recognize that your children are a gift from God and give heartfelt thanks for his blessing? 
Do you acknowledge that parenthood is a magnificent responsibility and do you promise with God's help to protect and nurture your children both physically, spiritually, and emotionally? Yes. Will you by the grace of God bring up your children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, striving to live lives that are consistent with God's word as godly examples to your children? Let marriage be held in honor among all. Do you um, promise with God's help to work for a Christ-centered marriage, a healthy Christ-centered marriage, for, both for your joy and the blessing of your children and the glory of God? Will you, relying on God for strength, pray regularly for your children, dedicating them to the Lord in the hope that they belong wholly to God and come to trust in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins and the fulfillment of all of his promises to them, even eternal life. Yes. All right. Well, with that, um, Emmy Lou, I'm going to pray for you. May the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you and lift up his countenance to you and give you peace. And Lord, would you give her faith and blessing and um, just pray that she would be a godly woman, grow up in, in knowledge and strength and be a godly woman in all the ways that you have individually gifted her. Would you just provide for her through her family and through her church family? And we pray for these little ch- these two little children and also the other children in the church that your, your spirit would be at work among them. Lord, we think of John the Baptist who was filled with the Spirit in the womb and leapt for joy. And we we, we just pray for your your Spirit's influence on these little children and your protection and, and just faith for them. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Bless you guys. You may be seated. All right, come on up. You can, you can come up. That's fine. I'm I'm basically done. Um, just fitting that it's also the the fourth Sunday of the month, the family service. Not that every every service is a family service, right? But um, on the fourth Sunday, there is no jam for the first to fifth grade kids. So Jesus and me time that is the class the first to fifth graders go to during the sermon time which they love, and it's a great time for them, but also it's good for them just to start learning, to, to be in church as a family, to worship God with the adults, see their parents worshiping the Lord. And, and, uh, but at the same time, we recognize that's not super easy sometimes and maybe adds a little bit of stress to your, your morning if you have some squirrely kids sitting with you. But we want to like relieve some of that and just say, don't be anxious about them making a little noise. Like, it's... It's fine. We, we want them here. We want you here. And we don't want you to feel a lot of extra pressure. They are a blessing from the Lord. And uh, with that, I want to not dismiss the Jam Kids today. So Jam Kids, you're staying here. There, is there a, a coloring sheet in the back for them? Uh, oh, it's, com- it's coming. It's coming up. Should I, is it time to dismiss all the little guys? Okay. So if, you, if your kids are in... Let me get this right here. I have a note paper here because otherwise I would butcher it. But we're trying to get used to, to calling the toddlers class, which is ages two and three, the squirrels. They're squirrels. It's maybe fitting. I don't know if these names are specifically chosen for typical characteristics of these age groups, but um, the two to three-year-olds are the squirrels. And the four to six-year-olds, so that's kind of preschool and kindergarten age, are foxes. Uh, Parents, if one of you could lead them to their class at this time, they still have class on the family service morning. So I'm trying to make this as clear as possible, but it's not super simple. Liam, after? After? It's better. Julie, are are you up next? Okay. So are they not, they're going to stay for right now? Yes? All right. So that was, that was a trial run. Everybody sit down. So 
Um, that's what will happen right after this kid's message time. And so I'm going to hand it off with that. So right after this, if you can walk your squirrels and foxes in a non squirrely fashion to their class, that would be great. Jam kids will still be here. And this probably stays down. So that means, kiddos, you get to come up here. So all you jam kids, all you squirrels and foxes, right up here. Yeah, Theo, come on, lead the way, my friend. This is what we do on our family Sunday. All the kids get to join us up here. You don't have to come, kiddos, but if you'd like to come, join us up here. Everyone has a place to sit, not on top of our friends, just next to our friends. Excellent. All right. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, we brought snacks. I love it. All right. Go ahead and have a seat. We'll just be up here for a few minutes. Hi, friends. Come on up. Excellent. Oh, room for everyone. Is this everyone? Excellent. All right, friends, so I want to start with a question for you. I want you to think, and then when you think of someone, I want you to raise your hand. Who is the greatest guy you know? Think about that. Who is the greatest guy that you know? Okay, Dominic? God. God, okay, good. Who else? Jonah and the whale. Jonah and the whale. You like the story of Jonah? Very good. Okay, I can't reach you, Henry, but go ahead and say it nice and loud. God. Okay, God. Yep. Good, good. How about you, Zinnia? God. Okay. Anybody think of someone different? Maybe someone you know. Analia? Dad and mom. Ooh, your mom and dad. Yes, I was waiting for them to make the list, Boaz. Messy. Who? Messy. Messy. Messy? Oh, he's a famous soccer player. Oh, excellent. Okay, thank you. Wasn't sure who Messi was. Yeah. Myla Reese. Myla Reese. And, oh, it's your younger brother. Excellent. Who else? The greatest guy you know, Bradley. Hi. Ezra. Ezra, your brother? Wow, in his short little life, he's earned that position all the way in the back. Your grandma and grandpa. So what is it about these people? Who wants to tell me why you think God is the greatest one that you know? Um, God. Yeah, why? Because he made the earth. Yeah, that's pretty cool, huh? Because he made the earth. That's pretty cool. One more thing. Why is God the greatest one you know? Because he's the one who created us. He created us. And remember, if you learn in Jam, he created us in his image. So let's see. Well, hello, Bradley. So some of you, so Boaz, what makes Messi the greatest guy you know? What is it about him? He's the greatest soccer player in the world. Because he's the greatest soccer player? Is there anything else about him that makes him great? No? Anybody else? Who said their mom and dad was the greatest one that they knew? Who was that? Everly, why? Analia, why is that? Why are they the greatest that you know? What is it about them? Because they take care of us and love us. They love and take care of you, absolutely. Well, I want to tell you kids this morning about someone else who was pretty great. And this is someone from the Bible. How many of you have ever heard of Stephen? Have you heard of Stephen from the Bible? Not Stephen, the soccer player. You've heard his name? Yeah. Do you guys know anything about Stephen from the Bible? Okay. Boys and girls, Zinnia is going to tell us something she already knows about the greatest guy, Stephen, from the Bible. Um, You don't want to, okay. He was one of those people who... Oh, wow. You kind of told the end of the story there, didn't you? What do you think, Henry? 
So why was Stephen from the Bible? Why was he so great? Oh, do you know what he did? What did he do? Ooh. Is it the same Stephen I'm thinking of? <laughs> Let me just, I'm going to tell you about this Stephen. This is the Stephen from the book of Acts. And for those of you big kids that are staying in service, Pastor Bill's going to talk a little bit about him. Okay, are you listening? So Stephen from the Bible, he was a pretty good guy. So when the church started and the church was bigger, the church was bigger than all the people in this room. Do you guys, can you see all the people behind you? Can you turn around and look? The church that Stephen was a part of was bigger than all of them, way bigger. And Stephen had an important job. He was there to help take care of some of the needs that those people had. But the people, the apostles just didn't pick anyone. They picked people like Stephen who were good guys. They had a good reputation. And the Bible tells us that, the Bible tells us that Stephen was full of God's grace and power. Do the people that you know, is that Messi, the soccer player, do you think he's full of God's grace and power? Maybe he's full of some other things that make him a good soccer player. But are your parents full of God's grace and power? Stephen was. What's that? Okay. So Stephen was full of God's grace and his power. He did miracles among the people who went to church. He was wise, and when things got rough for Stephen, he did not back down. When people were telling lies, what? I, oh, okay, we'll we'll keep our hands to ourselves, okay? Thanks, guys. Woo, it's getting squirrely up here. Squirrel, squirrels, hands to yourself. Okay. Oh, you're a fox. Okay, fox is hands to ourselves. <laughs> hmm. So Stephen, he was a good guy. He loved Jesus. He loved to tell people about Jesus. And when people didn't like him telling people about Jesus, do you know what he did? He kept te- telling people about Jesus. He did not back down. Boys and girls, there are going to come times in your life where being a follower of Jesus, loving Jesus, people aren't going to like that. And they're going to try and get you to change your mind. But like Stephen, we are to be strong. We are to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit in us to stand firm in what we know is true, just like Stephen did. All right, boys and girls, in just a minute, I'm going to give you some instruction. If you're staying in the service, our jam kids, there are markers and colored pencils and your sermon note sheet. You can make some notes when you hear Pastor Bill speaking. And if you bring them to me after service, what might I have for you? Candy, yes. And if you are a squirrel or a fox, I'm going to have you go back and find your parents, and they're going to take you out the door where they're going to find your Sunday school teacher, and you'll head to your class, okay? So with walking feet, my friends, head back, grab your paper or head back to your parents to head to your class. Walking feet, Joshy, walking feet. Thank you, my friends. All right, so while they are making that transition, one thing that's, uh, we have so much happening um, in the life of our church body that, um, and we're at kind of a critical stage in in the process of us um, constructing our church facility. I need to make one other announcement. Actually, I'm gonna have Sue come up here and make announcements. It's a good time while parents are transitioning with their kids, so, oh, honey, okay. No, you can't, you have to. Good morning. Um, I want to first say how excited I am um, about what God's doing with our 
new building. And I hope you all uh, understand that it's only by God's grace that we're able to do what we're doing, uh, whether it's funding, whether it's a work crew, uh, lunch ladies, um, and prayer warriors. We really, really appreciate everybody's prayer in the process for safety and um, good weather. God has blessed us immensely with good weather on Saturdays, the last few Saturdays, and we have two more Saturdays to go to get the roof on. And we need all the help we can get these next two Saturdays. Now, I know it's hunting season for some, but uh, we need to get this job done before the rains really start coming. And we only have two more Saturdays to do that. So hopefully, uh, by God's grace, we'll have good weather. And uh, please consider, we need at least 15 people a day, each day on Saturdays, the next two weeks to get the roof done. And um, we hope that you will be able to do that. Even if you're not a uh, up on the roof kind of person, there's plenty of things to do. Uh, I was out there moving um, insulation all day yesterday. So lots to do. Please think about it. And if you're not able to make it, please pray for us. I'm going to pass this around because Chris needs to know who all is able to do it. And if you're available on a weekday, that helps too. Thank you. Awesome. Yes, thank you. And she was a little too kind. And first off, before you pass those out, I just want to say, you said you wanted to thank all the lunch ladies. Isn't your husband Dan one of the guys that does all the lunches as well? Yeah. All right, you're lucky he's not here, but I'm going to tell him you said that. All right. Uh, no, but we, she's too kind. We need more than 15 people. Um, and we need, for these two weeks, we need as many people as we can. Minimum of 15 people up on the roof, but that's a minimum. Um, and you younger guys especially, um, or wives sign up, your husbands, those kinds of things. We, we, this is two weeks We've been doing some arm twisting, but we need two weeks to get this enclosed to the weather, and the weather's coming quick. So, so um, I won't, I was asked to maybe call some people out by name in the service, and so I won't do that, though. Um, I'm tempted, but I won't. Anyway, please sign up to help out. It's a great time. It's from 8 till 2, and then the following week, we're probably going to go 8 until she's done. Right, Chris? Am I missing anything? Just, we, yeah, we, we need some help. So, all right, that's it, I think. Um, all right, let's um, turn to the book of Acts. Turn to the book of Acts, and um, we'll, we'll jump right in to the book of Acts. <laughs> okay. Let me pray as we do that. Father, we just, again, we come to your word. We're, we're so many things um, this morning just... To, not just information, but things that are just crucial to the life of our church family, from the newest little church member, Charlie, back there, all the way to the kids that were dedicated, and the rest, um, the rest of us, Lord. We, we're grateful to be part of your church family here worshiping you. And Lord, we recognize in all of these things, we would be lost without your word in our lives. And we come now to this time, we ask for the filling of your Holy Spirit, that we may grow in your grace and grow in your power. In Christ's name, amen. Well, you got a little bit of a primer from Miss Julie for the, the sermon, and we're going to be in Acts chapter 6, verses 8 through 16. And as you're thinking about this, and before we read it, just know that today is kind of an important day in the, the book of Acts. It's a transitionary day because we kind of move from what has been one of the key characters a guy named Peter, the Apostle Peter, who played just an important, important role in the life of the body of Christ, the brothers and sisters that came before us. And his role was primarily to bring the message of Jesus to the Jewish people, to help them untangle the web of their religiosity and, and their rules that they allowed to become their God rather than the God who lovingly created them. And so Peter really helped with that, and will continue to help with that. But we're going to start transitioning to a primary character, which will take us through the rest of the book of Acts. That character's name is Paul. But um, we first learn of Paul when we hear the name Saul, before Paul became a follower of Jesus. 
But this character that we're talking about today is this, this hinge pin between these two important apostles, and that's Stephen. And there's something about Stephen that uh, came out this week in just the preparation that was just <laughs> incredibly encouraging to me. And, and I'm excited to, to look at um, because it applies so well to every one of us in here. And so we're in this transition. Let's read. You can follow along. I read in the English Standard Version, the ESV, um, and I'll start at verse 8. It says, And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the Cyrians and of the Alexandrians and of those in Cilicia and Asia rose up and disputed with Stephen, but they could not withstand the spirit by which he was speaking. Then they secretly instigated men who said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and they came upon him and they seized him and they brought him before the council and they set up false witnesses who said, this man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law for we have heard him say that Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. And the last verse this morning is, and gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw his face was like that of an angel. Stephen is a critical player in the life of the church. And he showed us, as it was brought out in our kids' time, that he had super strong character. He had incredibly strong character. He also had, in his, his tool belt, I would say, is that he had incredible courage. That's something that's desperately needed today and will continue to be needed in the life of followers of Jesus. And then he showed us a picture of what it looks like to have an angelic countenance. And I would like to think that you all look at me and think that I have an angelic countenance, but that's just the spotlights uh, up above. Something made him um, pretty special. And due to that, he is, he is he's a, just a worthy saint before us that we can look and seek to, by God's grace and the filling of the Holy Spirit, follow his example. First thing we see about Stephen is just that. We see that he's filled with the Holy Spirit talk a little bit about that. We've talked about what that looks like today, and we'll talk about that more. But he was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he became God's mouthpiece. He spoke forth. He became God's mouthpiece to the point where um, he was filled with the Holy Spirit when he became saved. And not only that, but his words were not just his own words anymore. His words became God's words through the Spirit speaking in him. And it's just a very practical implication for us as well. When people in the church today talk about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's often talked about as this kind of mystical, um, what does it look like? It causes all kinds of trouble and dissension amongst different Christians. And, and that's to Satan's victory. It's not to the glory of God. The Holy Spirit, yes, although mysterious and beautiful and a spirit, um, is very real and very practical. And what it looks like to be filled with the Spirit um, is, is not as mystical and mysterious as it's made out to be. And, and we see that. We see it in Stephen as one who was filled by the Spirit. And let's look again at verse 8. Verse 8, 9, and 10. It says, And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs. We don't know what those were, but they were great. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the Cyrians and of the Alexandrians and of those in Sicilia and Asia rose up and disputed with Stephen. And then look at verse 10. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit by which he was speaking. That spirit there is a capital S if you notice. It's not the small s spirit of Stephen who is maybe well-spoken, which he may, probably wasn't. Or it's not the smallest spirit of Stephen who was really energetic that morning because he had his coffee. It's not the smallest spirit of Stephen in whom was um, very able to hold his own in conversation. Now, this was the capital S spirit, 
reflecting the Holy Spirit who was in Stephen, alive in Stephen, and speaking through Stephen. We see this over and over as as the book of Acts speaks of Stephen, talks about him as a man full of the Spirit and wisdom. We looked at that last week. Man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. In verse 8, it tells us he was full of grace and power. And then in verse 10, it tells us where all of that came from. And it came not from him, it came from the Holy Spirit. It came from the Spirit himself. So last week we looked at kind of the context of where they were at at this moment. The context was the church grew from 120 to 20,000 plus in just a small window of time. And in that small window of time, um, you can imagine it was a bit of an administrative and organizational mess. And so whether it was intentional or unintentional, some people got their feelings hurt because some of the widows of the Grecian Jews were being neglected by the leadership and by the church as a whole, not getting the support that they needed. But the Hebrew Jews that lived there in Jerusalem, they were getting plenty of support. And so this problem came, it had the, the ability or the, 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 it could have caused a great division in the church. But God gave wisdom to the apostles who put the problem back in the, in the lap of the, the church itself and said, you need, you need to pick seven men from among you to come and to help, or help with this, this problem so that no one's neglected. And then they, by God's beautiful picture and grace, they chose seven Greeks, not seven of the Hebrew leaders, but seven Greeks who had, who had um, the character by which was required from the apostles there. They had a good reputation. They were full of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and they were full of wisdom. We pointed out last week, and it's worthy saying again this week, that even though those seven men were chosen and appointed and then, and then anointed by and affirmed by the apostles, just because they were in that position doesn't mean that the rest of the church then, nor the rest of the church today, should not be, by God's power and his Holy Spirit's energy, striving to live just like these deacons, these seven that were chosen to live. This isn't just a them and an us. These just have to be seven men who were already functioning out of good reputation, being filled with the Spirit and having wisdom. But the rest of the church, all of us, are also to be striving for those very same things, not in our own strength, but in the strength of the Holy Spirit. So we don't get off, we don't get to just to put all of our issues on others or on leaders, or people that think they're, they're more apt to handle things than, than we are. The Holy Spirit that was in them is the same Holy Spirit was in you. It's just they had proven themselves to be people that were availed to the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit. But that was the one problem. Another problem was that they, because they made this healthy cho- choice to have these deacons now in place, the message of the gospel of Christ kept going forward. And more and more people kept getting saved, getting captured by grace, understanding forgiveness, and and knowing that it's about a relationship with God through faith in Jesus rather than following a bunch of rules or being a good person, being really religious, being really knowledgeable, being really rich or whatever. It was a relationship with Christ. The church just exploded. Even more, it says, multitudes more after that 20,000 kept coming. Even the priests it said there were priests that were coming to Christ, which that, and as we'll see later in Acts, created a whole other set of problems because these priests, like all people, when they came to Christ, they brought their baggage with them. We all bring our baggage, don't we, to our faith in Christ. And that's the goal of the Holy Spirit and the teaching of the church body to help us keep our eyes fixed and focused on the gospel of Christ rather than focusing on our traditional things. Because I've just noticed, and maybe you have too, that sometimes we fight more for our traditions than we do for truth. We can fight more for our personal opinions on certain things, stand for those things more than we do the truth. So here, in this case, these religious leaders that were non-Christian religious leaders are sensing something that's happening. As the church is growing and the people are getting saved, their power is decreasing. 
And whenever someone who's powerful loses some of that power, guess what? The the claws come out. And that's what's happening here. Their claws are coming out. And so they go after Stephen. They go after Stephen. And um, what's crazy about Stephen? And what really hit me in this week was that, that Stephen is, in essence, and I'm not making the text, I'm not reading the text into this, but Stephen is just like us. Stephen didn't meet, according to all the commentators, did not meet Jesus in person, didn't see Jesus' miracles in person. He was a guy that heard the message of what's going on with this Jesus guy, and then someone shared the gospel with him, and he received the gospel of Jesus, and it radically changed his life because he received the Holy Spirit when this happened, when he placed his faith in Christ, And then he began to be God's mouthpiece. And in this process, um, this is just a regular person that comes to know Christ and it radically changes his life. He's just like us. This This is the same call that you have on your life. It's not just for some. It's not just for the deacons or the religious people. This is This is the beauty of the gospel, that in Christ there is no distinction between rich or poor, educated, undereducated, men, women, slave-free, Jew-Greek. And their divides were, believe it or not, even far greater than our... Their divides were probably much more like what we're seeing in the divides between Israel and Hamas or Israel and that tension. Those Those were the things. And yet there's people on both sides of issues that are coming to Christ and they're letting go of all of those other things because of the freedom found in the gospel. Stephen was, was beautiful, but, but in this sense, because he represented this. He's very much like us, and it is encouraging because this is a work for all of us. It's not a work for some of us. If Christ is your king, if you've received him as your Lord by faith, and you're empowered by his spirit, which we'll talk about more in just a moment, then guess what? This is us. This is, this is our charge. It's more than just a building that's going up. It's an everyday lifestyle of being filled with the spirit and taking the message forward here as well as around the world. It's fascinating. It's fascinating when you think about it because Stephen was not an, a, a really well-educated person. He was an average person, but his averageness was totally overtaken by the fact that he was filled with the Holy Spirit. He made himself completely available. And so all of these very well-spoken, well-regarded religious people, they could not even come close to the wisdom that was, that was oozing out of Stephen. Because why? Because Stephen was full of the Holy Spirit. God has got so much of Stephen now that not only God is in him, but God is working through him, which is exactly what is to happen to every one of us, every one of us at this point in our lives. So don't miss that significance that he is just like us. So this is this is awesome. He he ultimately, when we look at the passage and we read just all the different times it points to Stephen being filled with the Holy Spirit, you could say that he was full of it. He was full of the Holy Spirit. Whereas the religious leaders were full of themselves. They were full of what they thought made them awesomer than everyone else. But he was full of it. And, and that's really a, a primary takeaway for all of us in here who are followers of Jesus that this is not something that happens at certain times in certain ways during certain events. This is a responsibility, and it's a glorious responsibility that every one of you who calls yourself a Christian has every moment of every day. You are to be a person filled with the Spirit. And as we said with Stephen, as we said before, what that means is it's not that God gives you more of his Spirit. It means that you avail yourself more to what that spirit is doing and is alive in you. The Holy Spirit is there, but we are prideful people and we we push him to the corner. Doesn't mean we're not saved, doesn't mean we're not believers. And it also doesn't mean that we have to have some special, holy, specific prayer that conjures up more of the Holy Spirit and makes us feel energized, like, oh, I feel the Holy Spirit. No, it is us saying, fill me with your spirit, Father. Holy Spirit, come fill me right now. I have a very spiritual example of this this last week. It's one of the joys of having to preach 
the scriptures. It always preaches at me. And I only use this example um, because I've not passed this test so often. But see, my, my sweet wife, who you saw up here with the kids, so you know her, she's wonderful. Well, um, she wants to bring home, well, not, it's not that she wants, she's bringing home a dairy cow. Some friends of ours have a cow, and she's been milking this cow for four months. A few weeks in, she's loving it so much, she's like, oh, we got to get a dairy cow. And I'm like, okay. I'm thinking, this too will pass. (laughs) And, uh, I mean, I get it. Uh, I bring home motorcycles, um, chainsaws, things, well, things that matter to me. But you don't have to milk them every day. Uh, so we have to now build this dairy shelter for this cow to be milked every day. Did I say that? Every day. Maybe twice a day. In any case, when we come together to do this, we have differences of opinions on how to build. Um, I tend to be a little bit more of a perfectionist. Yes? Uh-huh. Um, and she's more, let's just get her done. Let's just get it done. And anyway, in, in, in this case, this causes, and I don't know, you probably don't understand this, this can cause a little bit of tension when we come together and, and, and work on a project together. And that's what was happening here. We're working away at this. It had been um, a long afternoon already, and I'm feeling, you know, like this door would have hung a lot better if the building was square. I did say that, those words, right? Exactly, pretty much, yeah. And, um, and then she reminds me we're not building a spaceship. It's a dairy parlor. And uh, it got, I'm laughing with, you see me smiling. I wasn't feeling these smiles coming out of me. But I am, I am thinking on this text, and this text is preaching at me. And not tongue-in-cheek in a very real way, I said out loud to the Lord that... Fill me, Holy Spirit. Fill me with love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. And then I may have added something about, I really need it because my wife's not making this easy on me right now. No. Um, And, uh, I, you know, um, we're almost done and we're still strong, right, honey? Yeah, we're... uh, and sweet old Surrey will be coming home very soon and will benefit from that beautiful raw milk. Um, but in, in reality, in reality, um, this is the life of a follower of Christ. I have 27 years of experience of not walking in the spirit, doing projects with my wife. You should have seen it. My wife used to cut my hair. I used to have hair. And she would cut my hair when we were young married. And I mean, marriage counseling. It was not, I was not Jesus-y. I wasn't full of the spirit. And we can laugh at that now. Um, but this is, this is us. Um, this is us in our lives with our spouses, with our children, with our neighbors, with our coworkers, our friends, our church family. Whether we're building a, church facility and over there working or whether we're dealing with hardship and heartache, that we call upon the Spirit to fill us. Praise God that we can recognize that we're ready to get really frustrated and pop. But the filling of the Spirit isn't a one-time event. We have to, by God's grace and power, open ourselves to the Spirit and ask the Spirit to fill us with love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and self-control. And the reason we need to do that is because there um, are people in our lives and there is a lost world that needs Jesus. And our feelings at the moment when we're feeling frustrated or um, hurt and whatnot don't matter as much as the mission that is on us as followers of Christ to live out the gospel, to live it out full of the Holy Spirit. And it Simply, I'm just exhorting you, in your life, don't over or under spiritualize our responsibility to be filled with the Spirit of God, not filled with our own frustrations and angers, 
uh, not filled with our own agendas, our own traditions, um, for ourselves, for our children, for our church, for our family, but to be filled with the Spirit of God. It's not fancy, it's not mystical, it's walking in the Spirit. We're called to walk in the Spirit, to, to put off the things of this nature and put on the things of the Spirit. And that's what matters. We can, as we've said many times, we can be a, a warm, loving, grace-filled church and still miss the point if we're not filled with the Spirit. And I don't want to ever have us, any of us, to, to be caught up in our own agendas, but I just I confess it's so easy to do. It's so easy to do because it's easy for us to compartmentalize our lives. We need to be people that walk in the Spirit. And we see it in Stephen here to the point where he was facing something none of us have ever faced, the type of scrutiny that he was ever facing. And one of the things that was mentioned by someone, one of the wonderful little kiddos here that uh, I don't know if you heard it in the microphone, but they said he was the first one that was killed for the faith. Stephen is our first martyr. And he was killed by being unjustly accused of something. His words twisted and um, ultimately was murdered for the faith because of his stance for Jesus. He was being mistreated and he didn't bomb people back or throw insults back at them. He took it with great courage and didn't forget the filling of the Spirit in his life. Stephen was filled with the Spirit. He was God's mouthpiece. The second thing that we look at is he followed in the footsteps of Jesus. This is the practical side of things. He followed in the footsteps of Jesus. And you know this because if you look at the story of Acts and you look at the gospel story, we see what seems like to be a, a repeating script. Jesus, he was full of the Spirit and he ministered to people. And as he did this, he was murdered for that. Peter, religious leader um, in the Christian church, but the religious people of that day, they hated him and they sought to kill him, shut him up. Same thing with John, full of the spirit and it ministered to people around him. The apostles, as it said in chapter five, these people ministered and as they ministered, guess what happened? They got beaten for it. And Stephen is the same way. He's filled with the Spirit, and he cares for people around him. He speaks the truth, even when it's hard. Verse 11 says, And they secretly instigated men who said, We have heard him speaking blasphemous words against Moses and God. If you ever see people that are either coming to you and wanting to say something, or they're, you see other people talking quietly or secretively, it's normally um, not a good thing. It says in verse 12, and they stirred up the people. That, that, that picture literally is like stirring a pot of soup. So the interesting thing about these people being stirred up was that when they were stirred up to a point, um, these same people were the very same people earlier in Acts who saw the things that God was doing, and guess what? They were excited. They were supportive of the Christians because they saw this as a good cultural cause. Good things are happening, even if they hadn't come to know Christ yet. And now, just shortly later, because of the lies and because of the persuasive words of these religious leaders, non-Christian religious leaders, these same people that were once supportive of the Christians are now turned against them. It's a great lesson for us, because like Miss Julie said, we live in a culture today a culture that does not love what we love, doesn't value what we value. And just by standing for the truth, uh, we're ridiculed for that. Our reputation is affected by that. Maybe our job is affected by that or our pay scale is affected by that. And it's an important reminder to us that we have to be guarded against popular opinion. It would be guarded against a cultural pressure that are around us all the time. A cultural pressure that is so beaten into our, our world today that if you would just say something that is white is white, then you're a bigot. You know the issues, the issues of abortion, the issues of gender, and on and on and on. There are these issues where, like Stephen, as followers of Christ that are filled with the Spirit, walk in grace and power. It takes great grace 
to have to deal with a culture that hates us, and it takes great power to be able to withstand that and not cave. Stephen showed us this example as he walked in the footsteps of Christ Jesus. They set up false witnesses against him, and they said that he said Jesus will destroy this place, will change his customs, which is a lie. And gazing at him, all who sat at the council saw that his face was that of an angel. So <clears throat> this is incredible. This is a beautiful, beautiful story. We're going to see uh, more specifically what happens um, to Stephen next week. And it's perfect timing because we're going into the week to pray for the persecuted church that following week. And it started with the first martyrdom in our Christian faith, which was this man, Stephen. Um, Stephen was a holy troublemaker, in essence. He was full of the Spirit of God, just like we can be and must be. He was full of the Spirit of God, and he was not willing, he was not afraid. He was not willing to be pushed around. He was not afraid to be vocal, and he was not going to be silent. He's going to stand up and speak no matter what the consequences are. And I just want to remind us all that that is our job too in this day and age. I pray that it is always grace and truth. The power is tempered by the, by the grace. But we are people of the Spirit, filled with the Spirit. And yes, guess what? You say you're a Christian, you're going to be linked to, I think I can sensitively say, the wacko um, that stands up and holds a sign and screams with anger um, Bible verses from a street corner at people that they don't know, thinking they're doing God's will. That's just part of the gig. That's what makes it easy for the opponents to categorize all Christians in that that category of being a bigot. Um, the reality is we're ambassadors for the gospel of grace and truth. And the way that we deal with these issues is by being filled with the spirit, not allowing the pressures of this world to keep us silent and not allowing the pressures of maybe our emotions that make us want to lash out. Stephen was a holy troublemaker and it was a beautiful thing. And there's so much more, but... Um, I want to just close. Uh, yesterday, something happened to me that has never happened before, and that is that um, at a funeral yesterday, um, here at the church of Mindy Smith's father, um, I, was, I was compelled to not preach my message that I had prepared. And the reason why is because of a guy named Len. I didn't know Len from anybody. Well, Len was the son of the man who had passed away, Bob, Mindy's father. And he was, I mean, he lives down in, outside of Eugene, but he would fit in well with us. He's a Yakultian through and through. Um, as a matter of fact, um, yeah, we, we were almost dressed the same. It was great. Um, he's construction-y. He's in the construction trade. A little bit gruff. Um, um, yeah, a little, bit of, a little bit of edgy construction site vernacular, as he shared. Um, but he shared by starting to saying, I just have five things I want to share that my dad taught me. And he goes through these five things, and it was awesome. It was heartfelt. Things like, he taught me the ABCs, which is always be cool. Um, my dad taught me what it means to be a hard worker. And he walks through his dad's resume of what he taught him, these five things. That was great. It was actually really good. Um, People were laughing and tearing up. And then, and then he came, and I thought he was done, and he goes, but there's five things that my dad didn't teach me that I wish he would have. And I thought, oh, boy. Now he's going to rail on his dad at his dad's memorial. That's what I'm thinking. I'm like, how am I going to, Lord, fix this when he's done talking? It's kind of what's going through my mind. And, um, and, and then he goes this. He says these words. He says, my dad never taught me to admit that I needed help. And my dad never taught me, and this is the construction guy that just gave, he says, he never taught me to admit that I'm a sinner. My dad did not acknowledge, um, teach me to acknowledge God's love for me through Jesus Christ. My dad never taught me how to pray for forgiveness for my sin. And my dad never taught me to ask God 
to come in and fill my life and be my Savior and my Lord. And then he said, I think every dad should tell their kids that lesson. And then he said, I don't know about you. I don't know where you're at as he's speaking to the congregation that was there, the people there. He goes, but if you haven't um, done this, you know, being at a funeral makes you think about these things. And I just encourage you to think about this. And then he went and led him in the sinner's prayer. And I would just say that in a room this size, there's people in here that have never given their life and their heart to Jesus and had the joy of being filled with the Holy Spirit. And um, I'd just like to do what he did, follow his example. And if this is you, pray this along with me as we close. Heavenly Father, I admit that I have spent my life leaning on my own abilities and my own strength, and I admit that I need your help. And more than that, God, I need your forgiveness for my sin. I need to let you in to lead my life, to be controlled by your Holy Spirit. Jesus, be my King and my Lord, my guide, and let my life be lived for you and for your glory from this day forward. I love you, and I pray this in the Lord Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that for the first time, then you're a brother or sister in the Lord, and I uh, trust that you did. And uh, for those of you who are staunchy old Christians like myself, be filled with the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. Call on the Spirit, especially when you're building dairy shelters with your spouse. All right, amen. Uh, please stand as we close in this song together. One day when sin was as black as could be Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin Dwelt among men, my example is he Word became flesh and the light shined among us His glory Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day, oh glorious day.
the trumpet will sound for his coming one day the skies with his glories will shine wonderful day my beloved one bringing my savior jesus is mine living he loves me dying he saved me buried he carried me my sins far away rising he justified have our prayer team up front up here so anyone if you want prayer for anything even if it's just something the Lord impressed on you from the sermon or something going on in life don't be shy to come up and get more prayer Um, and now because um, it's not just little babies or kids that need God's blessing I'm gonna say a blessing over all of you right out of numbers six so the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you and lift up his countenance to you and give you peace. And all the people said, Amen. You're dismissed.